Good morning. Good morning. All right. Welcome to the seventh annual Women in Leadership Conference held by the Andrus Center for Public Policy. I'm Tracy Andrus, and I have the privilege of serving as president and chairman of the Andrus Center, and we're a proud member of the uh, Boise State University and the School of Public Service. I think we've got a tremendous program for you these next two days, and to start it off right, I want to make an introduction that brings me great personal joy and brings everyone here at Boise State great pride. President Marlene Trump grew up next door to Idaho in Green River, Wyoming. A first generation university graduate, President Trump's planned pathway to medical school changed course when she fell in love with Robert Browning's poetry. Instead of going on to medical school, she earned a bachelor's degree in English, then a master's degree, and ultimately a doctorate for which she wrote a dissertation on Victorian novels and the new laws being written then on domestic violence. President Trump's focus on gender issues continued while serving as dean of Arizona State's new interdisciplinary college of arts and sciences and vice provost of the university's West Campus she also co-chaired a university-wide task force aimed at combating sexual assault. President Trump's list of accomplishments and accolades is long and distinguished. And you'll find more about her on the inside of your program. And if you make a whole lot of noise, we might just convince her to come back next year to be one of our keynote speakers. I give you the seventh president of Boise State University, Dr. Marlene Trump. Good morning. I must say to you that it is a pure joy to stand before this room today. Thank you so much for being here. To be a part of this extraordinary organization, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you will do. Because I look out over this room, I walked into this room and I felt this kinetic energy. That energy is the energy that's gonna change the world. The work that you are doing the ways in which you lead will be transformative. We have so much research now, unequivocal research, that shows that when we diversify leadership teams, and that's diversify on every measure, when we diversify our leadership teams across many textured ways of bringing in new voices, we make better decisions, we think, in more textured ways, we produce better outcomes. So developing women leaders is a critical way to advance the state, advance our organizations. It's a critical way. Do you know that Warren Buffett will not invest in a company that doesn't have women on its board of directors? And the reason that he won't do that is because he knows these facts. It changes the way organizations think. When you bring people from different backgrounds, whatever those backgrounds are, onto a board, it changes the way those organizations think. But right now, today, only about 18% of Fortune 500 boards have women on their boards of directors. And those organizations outperform those without that diversity on their boards. They generate more revenue. They have greater success in the marketplace. I think that is unequivocal, don't you? Talk about ROI. So investing in you 
and your growth and your development and having these wonderful mentors come to this program and be a part of this program advances not just you, which should be an ethical imperative for us to advance the people with whom we work. It advances your organizations. It advances our state. And I am so proud that the Andrus Center is engaged in a part of Boise State University. Let me tell you why I came here. So I spent my um, early years doing all the things that a working class girl whose dad is a Trona miner from Wyoming does. My uh, uh, summers were filled with waiting tables and slicing deli meats. Um, I, I listed for the census, there were often times when I was working three jobs, even when I was in school. Because that was the only way I was going to get to have a college education. There weren't many options for my family. And my father actually was a brilliant, brilliant man, but he'd only been able to take a few classes because it was a working class man. He got called back to work for his family. It was not an option for him. So my father was a manual laborer his entire life. And he wanted nothing more than to see his daughters have an opportunity to have an education. And he told me when I was a little girl, I was seven years old. He said, honey, and for a man of my father's generation, so my father was born in the 20s. For a man of my father's generation to say this is a phenomenal thing. He said, honey, if you want to be president of the United States, you can be. I want you to get out there and take on the world. And I loved school so much that actually when I was a senior in college, somebody said to me, you know, what are you going to do when you graduate? And I said, I don't know. I just want to figure out how to stay here for the rest of my life. And guess what I did? <laughs> but what I found along the way were people who intervened for me and stuck their neck out for me. I have my investiture next week. And I don't know if any of you are coming to my gala. Joy Harjo, the first Native American poet laureate of the United States of America, is reading at my gala dinner. If you don't have tickets, there are still tickets available. Um, it's a benefit for scholarships for Idaho students who would otherwise not be able to afford their education. And I'm so excited about endowing this scholarship. It's called our True Blue scholarship. But one of the people who's going to be there is the woman who walked across the street to me and said, honey, you need to go to college, who was a guidance counselor. And my father said, we don't know how we're going to afford school. And so she cooked up a plan with one of the other guidance counselors in the school. And he called me in. He was my guidance counselor. And he said, honey, can I have your, your college essay draft that you wrote in your English class this year. And I said, sure. He goes, I want to review it and give you some feedback. And I said, my dad said I can only apply to the local community college because that's all we can afford. And he said, well, let me just see your work. You know, we'll see what we can learn from it. And this could only have happened in the 80s. He applied to schools for me and paid the application fees. And he called me into his office and he said, Marlene, I've got great news for you. You've been accepted to Bryn Mawr University. You've been accepted to all seven universities I applied to on your behalf. With a, but Bryn Mawr with a full ride scholarship, tuition, books, housing, everything. Your expenses will be 100% covered. So he handed me this letter. I, actually, what I said, because I grew up in Wyoming before the internet, I said, what's Bryn Mawr? He said, trust me, you're going to love it. So I brought home this letter, and I showed it to my dad. I waited for my dad to get home from work. He drove an hour to the mines in Wyoming weather every day and an hour home every night. And he was working a lot of overtime at that time to make sure that even if I went to community college, we'd be able to afford school. And I handed him this letter. And he said, honey, there's no way this can be real. He thought it was like a publisher's clearinghouse letter. <laughs> and
And I was 17, so I couldn't accept the scholarship on my own. So I did not go. So this woman across the street came back over to my house, pounded on the door. She had her hands on her hips, and she said, is what I hear true? And I said, what's that? And she said that you are not going to university. And I said, yes, ma'am, that's right. And she said, what's the rule? And what my father had said was, look, it's so far away. If you got all the way out there to Bryn Mawr and this turned out not to be real, how would we afford to get you home? So she said, okay, she pulled out an atlas and she drew a circle and she said, this is where you can drive there and back in one day, let's find you a school. <laughs> Without the support and mentorship of so many people, I wouldn't have the extraordinary opportunity to be where I am today, which is at this amazing place that has transcended and exceeded everyone's expectations that looked like this sleepy little place in this town in Idaho that has had this meteoric rise from a junior college to a research university in a space of time that has probably never been matched in higher education in this country to this day. Because it is innovative and creative and scrappy and people have worked hard. Just like me, I am so proud to be here. And I am so proud that this organization is going to help you go out there and do those creative, innovative, scrappy things with a support network that will help you make your mark, just like Boise State. So thank you for being here. I am so delighted at the program, and I'm very sorry to say that because we have a President's Leadership Council meeting today, which is all the presidents in the, in the, uni in the universities and colleges in the state of Idaho are meeting, I have to leave right after this. They're gonna shepherd hook me off the stage and off I go down the road. But I'm so delighted that you're here. I'm so proud that we're hosting you, and I can't wait to see the amazing things that you will do next. Thank you. Thanks, President Trump. And I suspect we're going to work really hard to bring her back next year. OK, I have to do some podium notes before we get on with our program, just some of the ways and wares of how we operate this thing. Um, but I have a couple real fast key introductions. Last year, the Andrus Center completed the funding on our endowed chair for environment and public lands. And we were able to um, install our inaugural chair. I'd like to recognize the Cecil D. Andrus Chair for Environment and Public Lands, BSU's distinguished professor, Dr. John Freemuth. John, are you around the? He's probably still out working on new name tags. <laughs> she missed our conference last year because she had her second son days before we went, uh, came in here. But she's back at the helm and with a new title. And again, I'm sure she's still out there working. But I want to recognize the Andrus Center's executive director, Katie Roberts. And by the way, uh, Dr. Trump talked about boards and the need for uh, diversity. Our, I'm glad to say, I, I threw out a challenge last year because the Andrus Center's board was only 46% women last year. And I said, we'll be at 50% next year. You hold me to it. And I want to tell you, we actually overshot our mark a little bit. We're at 52%, but we've been, we're about to invite a gentleman back on. We'll be at 50 50%, and that's where we belong, and that's where every board belongs. Okay, we also want to thank Katie's volunteer army, that, uh, without which we could not put this on. They've got uh, lavender uh, name badges on. If you need something, grab them, grab one of us, any of us, and we'd be happy to help you. 
Uh, we're also thankful for our skill builder facilitators, who I think are wearing red tags, who are giving of their time and talent over the next two days and have developed a program that, frankly, is, is uh, one of the top attractants to, to this conference. And we want to thank Boise State University and especially the student union event and food service staffs who have worked so hard behind the scenes up until this day and will work so hard over the next two days to make sure that we have everything that we need. So, um, and, and last but certainly not least, I want to thank our sponsors. They're in the back of your program on page 30. We absolutely could not keep our costs down without these sponsors. Plus the fact they're telling you by their sponsorships that they believe in gender diversity. And so if you need something, take a look at the, at the list of names of those sponsors and think about supporting those who are supporting us. They do one other really important thing with their sponsorship dollars. And we started this a couple years ago and it has grown and we love it in that through their dollars, they sponsor about 40 high school students from around the Treasure Valley that we invite in to participate with us over the next two days. And these are really impactful experiences for these young people. I would like all of our high school sponsored um, students to please stand up so we can welcome you. You are our future, and we're, we're going to count on you to fix all the things that we've screwed up over the years. <laughs> okay, a couple of other things. One, something else that our sponsors made available, Perkins Coie, our sponsor, has made available free headshots. Now, we've been sending out notices on that, and today's headshots are all filled up. There's questions about where they are. They're in the foot room. You go straight down this hallway out here, turn right, and it's the second one on your left but there are a few spaces left for tomorrow. So after our first speaker is done and before you go to your workshop, check out at the volunteer table and see if you can uh, get your name on the list for one of those remaining spots tomorrow. Voter Registration League of Women Voters is back this year. Thank you so much. Please, if you are not registered to vote, you cannot change the world if you cannot vote. Please stop at the table and get yourself registered. Um, social media, our hashtag for the event is hashtag WomenLead2019, and we can be found on Facebook and Twitter at at Andra Center. Table etiquette. A lot of you are sitting with friends. Some of you are sitting with people that you don't know. We understand some people take notes on their laptops. As long as that's quiet, it's fine. But please don't engage in conversations that will distract the rest of your table mates from, from listening to our presenters. Also, there are icebreakers. There are ice, there's a little thing that looks like popcorn on your table. And if you've got time and you come back and, and everyone's not around, you don't know some of the people in there, you can just pull out one of these questions and ask somebody one of these questions. It's a great way to get to know people. Plus, you'll notice that we've, we've got um, mugs. Whoops. We've got mugs in your, uh, in your bags this year. We're trying to reduce our carbon footprint. You'll notice that we've got glass out there instead of throwaways. We've got the, the mugs, but now there are 800 of those in this room. So also in your bag are these little tags. You might want to grab one of them, stick your name on it, and tie it around that so that you've got the right mug when you go home. Um, Q&A cards. I'm looking for all my pieces and parts. I think I ended up without. You've got question and answer cards on your table. Here's the way it works with our speakers. They'll talk for about 40 minutes. At the end of that time, we're going to open it up for questions and answers. Write your questions down. And once they get started, you hold them up in the air. One of our volunteers will grab them. They'll bring them up here. We'll ask them. Um, your tables will be cleaned when you're out at the workshops, so please don't leave anything valuable at the tables while you're gone. The skill builders. The good news is that um, we cut off registration at 800 this year. We sold out in one week. Um, we're really excited to have everybody in one room. It will make the skill builders flow better. 
We didn't assign them this year because we can do that without, but that means some of them are going to fill up. So we will have volunteers outside. If one of them fills up, the volunteer will be able to tell you which ones are still open and help guide you to that spot. So if there's one you really want to see, you're going to want to go directly there. There's a map in your program on page 13 that shows you the room so that you can kind of do a little, a little planning ahead of time and get yourself there. Evaluations. There are evaluations in your uh, program and there are evaluations uh, in the skill builders. Please, we use those to know what we want to do next year. Please fill out the evaluations in the workshops before you leave them. And, and the one in your, uh, in your program, please leave that by the end of the conference so that this is the overall conference evaluation. Bathrooms and lactation rooms. We used to take over the men's bathrooms when we were here, but you know what? We have enough men joining us now that we can't do that. So please don't take over the men's bathrooms. We want them to have, to have bathrooms to use as well. But if there are any lactating mothers in the, in the room, there is a lactation room. You go down this hall halfway to where the hatch ballroom is, hang a right, and about midway down, just past midway down on the right, there is a room, and you'll notice a little uh, sign there for um, lactation. Uh, finally, at the end of the day, we are going to have the most awesome reception that you have ever seen. If you have been here before, you know that they, Boise State knocks it out of the ballpark on this, on this reception. So don't forget that. There are no host cocktails available. The only caveat is you can't take it out of the room. If you do, there will be somebody standing there asking you to take the alcohol back into the room. So I'm going to get off the stage, get our speaker up here, and I want to start things off right. Our first speaker is going to talk about women creating their own trail. And to introduce her, I want to bring up one such trailblazer of our own Boise City Council member, Lisa Sanchez. Good morning, everybody. Can I impose on you right away? Can we take an ussy? <laughs> For those of you who don't know what an ussy is, it, mean, it means it's not just me. I'm not taking a selfie. I'm going to take a picture of us. So, OK. Have on your lipstick. All right, ready? All right. Everybody lean in. Squeeze in. All right, thank you. Well, first of all, I would just love to thank my sister Katie for inviting me to be a part of uh, today's festivities. And um, since Jennifer Palmieri, our keynote, is very involved in politics, has a strong history, I know she will not mind that I'm going to impose on you once again. Um, since I have the mic, I'm going to take advantage here. So um, I, I'm the first Latina to serve on the Boise City Council. Thank you. And President Trump, who, I mean, how excited and grateful are we to have the first woman president at Boise State University? She's amazing. But I want to, I want to, allude to something that President Trump mentioned. She talked about all these people who showed up in her life to help her get here for us. And I have people like that in my life too. I call them angels. And um, I've had all kinds of angels uh, throughout my life. And over 10,000 of those angels voted for me in 2017. And so I just want to thank them so much for taking a risk on somebody who never worked on a campaign. Um, all I did was vote, listen to NPR, um, make my posts on Facebook. So I went from zero to running for office like that. And I have my angels here in Boise, Idaho to thank for that. And so I have introduced my first piece of legislation before city council. And I'm hoping I can get your support 
Um, as we know, we have a housing crisis, not just in Boise, but in our country. But I can only do my little bit here in Boise. So I propose legislation to put limitations on rental application fees because our renters are being gouged. They're paying hundreds of dollars <laughs> in application fees. And so what I would like to do is invite those of you who live in Boise who have experience with this issue, um, whether it's you yourself having paid hundreds of dollars in application fees trying to find rentals, or if you have adult children who are trying to get into rentals, or if you yourself are an ethical landlord, if you are Boise kind and you don't charge rental application fees, we want to hear from you on October 29th, which is our public hearing. Please come on down and testify. If you've never testified at a council hearing, please do me the honor of testifying at my first hearing for my first piece of legislation. Okay, without further ado, Jennifer Palmieri is one of the most accomplished political and communication strategists in America today. Palmieri served as head of communications for Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign and White House communications director under Pre President Barack Obama. Previously, she served as White House Deputy Press Secretary for President Bill Clinton, National Press Secretary for the 2004 John Edwards Presidential Campaign, and National Press Secretary for the Democratic Party. Palmieri is a frequent contributor to the Washington Post and other national print outlets, and is a frequent guest commentator on MSNBC news shows. Her keynote, The Second Century, A Trail of Her Own, is about 100 years after women won suffrage, we come to the realization that following a man's path has turned into a rut for women. Palmieri will tell us how we as women can blaze our own trail by embracing the value, ambition, and emotion women have had all along, and how we have the power to change the world by changing how we engage in it. Ladies and gentlemen, Jennifer Palmieri. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be introduced by our by uh, Councilwoman. Is that is that Councilwoman Sanchez? Thank you so much, and I'm so uh, proud of women um, doing first. I was also really inspired by President Trump's uh, talk. You know, it's a thing with women, particularly women in politics, um, that they don't think they have a story. Um, I worked for. Hillary Clinton's campaign, and when we were announcing her candidacy, I talked about going back to, like, let's go somewhere, go back to different places in your childhood, you know, tell your story. And she's like, I don't, she said, I don't have a story. Um, and I was like, what do you mean? She said, you know, my husband has a story. President Obama has a story. I don't have a story. Like, my life's not interesting. Hillary Clinton said this to me. <laughs> And it's a thing, it's a thing with women and um, women candidates in particular that they think that their life story isn't in interesting. Um, I think it's because um, women's stories yet, yet haven't been reflected in the American canon of like great stories that we, um, uh, uh, that we hold in our head and our hearts about what America's about, you know, like Bill Clinton. Um, he pulled himself up by his bootstraps. He was from Hope, Arkansas. President Obama sort of fulfilled a promise of uh, equality in America. Um, and with women, we don't, we don't see it. Um, and that's why I think it's so important that President Trump told her really inspiring story, uh, honoring her father, honoring the woman who helped get her uh, uh, where she is, because we are part of a long line, a long lineage of men and women both that have helped get us this far. And um, what I want to talk about today is how we build on that path um, by making our own. Um, I also want to thank uh, Tracy Andrus uh, for inviting me here. Um, 
And uh, I'm uh, so inspired by the work that uh, she does through uh, the uh, Cecil Andrews Center. My husband, Jim Lyons, is here. He is a very big fan of Cease, as I know you all call him, as he's referred to um, um, in our home, too. And I love being in the city of Boise. I happy, happily get to uh, have reasons to come here often. And this is a really amazing room. I, there's no place I'd rather be than in an enormous, huge ballroom full of women. Yay! <laughs> in the summer of 1776, right? With me, we're in Philadelphia. We're going to Philadelphia, summer of 1776. Like I said, we're going to go all the way back and then to come forward. Uh, Thomas Jefferson sat down, and I love thinking about this, by the way, you know, because was, it was on him to write the first draft of the Declaration of Independence. Um, and you can imagine that his colleagues were giving him a hard time, like Franklin's, Benjamin Franklin's like, where is the draft? <laughs> Jefferson's like, oh, I gotta get that done. I gotta just like go to my hotel room and knock this out. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, I think, that's, I think that's what it's like. I think people are, are this, you know, humans are the same throughout time. And so eventually Thomas Jefferson buckled down. Uh, the book 1776 has a good description about this, about like his procrastination of this. And, um, and he wrote these words that were radical at the time. And they were, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That, at the time, was a radical concept. That was the summer of 1776. 72 years later, in the summer of 1848, Marianne McClintock, she was an abolitionist, and uh, she lived in New York, and she was going to participate in the Seneca Falls. I see some head nods. I love that. <laughs> um, she was going to participate in the uh, Declaration, uh, the Seneca Falls Convention. And it was assigned to her to, to write the first, the first draft of the Declaration of Sentiments, right? So we sort of associate that with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who you know, was one of the leaders, uh, but the prime leader of the convention. But um, the McClintock family was asked to do the first draft. And so she's an abolitionist. A lot of the suffragists were also abolitionists. And she sat down at her kitchen table with her two daughters. And they worked on different drafts, and there had been different drafts from before that people had been massaging and working over, and they were unsatisfied with them. And one of the women, we don't know who, because it was not recorded in history, um, said, came up with the idea of basing it on the Declaration of Independence, right? Let's just use that as our model. And they made one change. <laughs> They said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. And I was so, in it, in it, you know, it laid the precedent for what I have come to make my peace with and accept and learn from that we build on what became before us. Usually what came before us was written, what was written down was written by men. But to take that promise of equality in America and, ex and expand it to include women was genius, 72 years after 1776. 72 years later, we got suffrage. It was not until 1920, except for in this state, because in this state, in Idaho, um, women got the right to vote in 1896, fourth state to do so. Something about the West, friends. Isn't that right, Tracy Andrus? Something about, I really believe this is true, because um, you know, something about um, Wyoming, unfortunately not, Idaho has the distinction of electing the first woman to the state legislature. But I think there's something about the frontier spirit in the West, a partnership between men and women in order to survive that made the, you know, push the West further, faster in this direction. Um, and it was 20 years before the, another woman was elected to the first, um, the first woman was elected to Congress, right? 20 years after, um, Idaho got, gave women the right to vote. And that woman was Jeanette Rankin, right? Your neighbor in Montana. Um, and an interesting thing about Jeanette Rankin, she was a pacifist, right? It's a weird quirk of fate. She voted twice in Congress. She's in Congress twice, only for a total of four years at the most. Um, and the first time she had to vote on World War I, and the second time she was in Congress 20 plus years later, she had to vote on World War II, and both times she voted no. 
And we treat this fact that she was a pacifist as like a quirk, right? Um, as, a, as a some sort of fluke and also as a reason why she shouldn't be taken seriously as if it's not remarkable and important that the first woman that was elected to Congress was a pacifist. You know, maybe if women had been in charge all along, we wouldn't think that war was a solution, right? Maybe if women had been in charge all along, as she said, you would think war, you can, no, you can no more win war than you can win an earthquake. It's not the ultimate solution. 72 years after uh, 1920, when we got the right to vote, we had 1992. I was working on Capitol Hill in 1992. This was decreed the year of the woman, okay? It was decreed the year of the woman because Anita Hill testified against the confirmation of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. And it was decreed the year of the woman because four women won a Senate seat. <laughs> Four. <laughs> there was uh, one woman was reelected that year, Barbara Mikulski, and four other women were elected to the United States Senate. And that, so there was a total of six women in the United States Senate, and we considered that the year of the woman. In 2018, that was the next year of the woman. We grew. Um, there is now, the Congress is now, the House of Representatives is now about 24% women, and the United States Senate is 25% women. Do you know when institutions change? This is like a thing. Do you know when you hit that mark where institutions change? When you have, how many women you have to have in the room in order to make that, to make it, make it really different? It's 30%. So it doesn't even have to be, of course not, right? Because you get, if we give us 30% of a room and we own it. Um, <laughs> so we are close, but not, but not quite there. And suffrage is interesting because you know that was, that was a controversial thing. It was not all women coming to the Seneca Falls Convention thought that it should be in the Declaration uh, of Sentiments that women should have the right to vote. It was a very controversial idea. But they eventually, and I think it's genius, they eventually saw that that was the way you leap for our power. Uh, power systems, right? Is if, yes, there were all sorts of grievances that women had about their inability to own property and their inability to hold down a job and how they had to uh, forfeit their wages to their husband and all of these things were enshrined in law. So you could try to get those laws all changed or you could, you could give women the right to vote and understand that that political power would give them the ways that and the means to make that change, which is eventually what happened. And the way I look at it, that suffrage, that vote, that gave women an entrance into the man's world, right? Prior to that, that had been locked out to them. And it's remarkable when you think about this, that it's only been 100 years. I mean, consider it the scope of human history, 100 years women have had the right to vote have had entrance into the man's world, entrance into the professional world. And so we've made remarkable progress in that time. Hillary Clinton's mother was born on June 4th, 1919. That is the day the Senate passed the 19th Amendment, okay? Her mom, right? Not like her grandmother or her great-grandmother, her mother was born on that day. And her daughter came on to, went on to be the first major um, the first nominee of a major political party in the United States. Like, that's remarkably fast and something to be celebrated. But then, like, it's just felt like, you know, and obviously I worked for her, so I was a little disappointed at the outcome of the election. But beyond, beyond politics, it just feels like we've sputtered, right? Like, sort of plateaued. Banging up the same, you know, banging up against the same kind of glass ceilings. And, you know, so now I'm like, all right, what do we do now? Um, the Declaration of Sentiments laid out, you know, it enumerated all of the grievances of women. And it was pretty, the women has pretty easy to identify what those obstacles are. And now it's a little murkier for us, right? I mean, it, I, I don't, you, you can't, there's not some silver bullet law that you look at that says, well, why are women still not progressing as well as fast as men? Um, I don't think that, you know, there's, I think that we could pass the Equal Rights Amendment. I think that would be to enshrine women's rights into the Constitution would help. But what we're really talking about is changing what's in our minds, women's minds, men's minds, all of our minds, these biases that we hold that continue to, you know, hold women back.
I saw a New York Times story last year that said there were fewer women CEOs in 2018 in America than there were in 2017. And I found it like the least surprising news ever. I found it even sort of validating, right? Because <laughs> you think at that point, like, we are not doing this wrong. We are not. Ladies, like, we are not doing this wrong. This is not, it's like, oh, what, what do women need to do to be more successful in, the, in these companies? It's like, no. You know what? There's also not a lot of NFL, there's not, also a lot of women quarterbacks in the NFL. Because, <laughs> like, that's another power system that was built by men for men and suited for their skills. You know, so what do you do now? that there are not more, fe for more female CEOs. There's also, in the Fortune 500, there are more CEOs named James, <laughs> seriously, than there are women CEOs. <laughs> there are more men named James that are CEOs in Fortune 500. So what do we do now that we see, yeah, I know, yeah, that there are more female, that, you know, or that the US women's soccer team, who are four-time women world champs, right? <laughs> get paid nearly three times less their male counterparts, who, you know, as you all know, failed to even qualify for the World Cup. And I've made this point before, and, and I've been told by men, well, you know, the thing is, the way market forces are, there's more interest in men's sports, and they just, you know, they drive, their ticket sales are higher. So it's like, yes, I know that. I'm very aware that you built the market to value men more than women. That is my point. <laughs> <laughs> that is the kind, that's the root change that we have to get at, right? It's like, what do we value? Who do we think is worthy? Who do we think is important? There are more men, more men get entry level jobs, even though women have gotten more bachelor's degrees for years and they rise to management faster. You know, there is, you know, you have this, you have this own experience in your, in your own life where you're told, there's nothing wrong with you, he's just the right fit for the job that you wanted, right? Just like he was for the last job that he wanted and the job before that and the job before that. And he was <laughs> because, you know, and it's not even, it's not men's fault, it's not anyone's fault, but we spent centuries and centuries building the world to be a comfortable place for men and their skills, right? That's just how the world developed. So I think that what my conclusion has been that it's time to make a declaration of our own. And like the McClintock women to you know, sit down at our kitchen tables, that's what I have done. I've sat down at our kitchen table and I've written a declaration of independence from a man's world. This is our path for the second century of American feminism. Now, as I have assured my husband many times, it's not a declaration of war. <laughs> <laughs> um, men are not my enemy. I just don't see any reason for us to continue to follow their path. It is not a path for us. It is a rut. Um, you know, part of this may be self-preservation. After being rejected for too long, you grow to have a little disdain for a place that doesn't value you and your skills, right? Feel a little spicy about it. But... I think there's just a deeper awakening that's happening in women's minds and souls, right? I don't even want what the man's world offers. Like, I just want out. I just want out. I just want a place where I can take my best self and bring it into the world. I didn't always feel this way. Um, I thought that going into the workplace, I thought that... The goal was to act like the men, to be like the men. I was very grateful to the baby boomer women, who, that generation that came before me, because they like fought to make, to make way so that I had a place in this world. And I actually thought that's what I was supposed to do, was to be like them. But something happened along the way, and I, I realized that while I thought I was doing great in the man's world, right? You know, and I had like pretty, pretty good success in politics. What I was really doing was I was great at keeping it going. This is an important point. I was great at perpetuating it. 
I made it all run well, right? The guys would all say about me, we can't do it without her. Jennifer, she's a great number two. Yeah. I got good jobs. I got them 10 years after the guys did, you know. When I first came to the Obama White House, I was the deputy communications director. And I was a deputy to, some, uh, to someone, Jan Pfeiffer, who was 10 years younger than me. I eventually got that job. And it wasn't that Dan wasn't supportive. Dan was very supportive of me. Uh, all the men I worked with were. That's the point. Nobody deliberately tried to hold me back. The point is they didn't have to be deliberate about it. Because it was built for them. Here's where you're not wrong to have the imposter syndrome, right? You are in a world that wasn't built for you. But what I see now is I just, I just find it a less appealing place. Honestly, like the man's world, it can be a little mean-spirited, right? It can be a little mean-spirited. People using power to keep power for themselves. People using power to make more money. Like, that's not worth it to me. And I want to be able to do well and put more love in world and, and love and understanding in the world. And I reject the notion that you can't do both. I do want to stress, because I think it's important for women and men both to know that I don't feel aggrieved, right? Um, you know, partly, I'm very proud of the accomplishments I've, I've made, and I don't want to lament what came before. Um, I'm not prepared to take my whole life taken from me and repackaged as it's like one long exercise in subordination, right? <laughs> That's not my life. Um, and it's, it's, you know, as I said before, it's not anyone's fault. We have uh, made peace, I've made, I've made my peace with what came before, and what I've realized is I've learned a ton in this man's world, right? Um, I've come to conclude that it was this, the world that I grew up in professionally was not women's destination. We're just passing through this on our way to someplace better. I'm like, I, look, I learned a lot from the man's world. I have mastered it. I know how to succeed in it. I know how to make it run well. And now I, just, I am moving on. Consider this if um, I think it's helpful to reorient our thinking about, um, about why women still struggle to succeed in the professional workplace. Imagine if um, you were a man and all your life you grew up um, where your town was super excited every Friday night to watch girls play soccer, right? And there was like all sorts of pageantry and parades and homecoming kings uh, that would happen during halftime where, where you're watching girls play soccer. And on Sunday, everybody sat around the television set and watched women play soccer. And every president of the United States had been a woman. And 75% of Congress were women. And 92% um, and of Fortune CEOs were, were women. Like, don't you think you might feel a little out of place? <laughs> It's not you. <laughs> You're not doing it wrong. It's, it is some place that was built with someone else in mind. I had a really remarkable moment with a colleague of mine during the Me Too movement. I mean, like when Me Too was really um, first taking off in the fall of 2017, and it was a man who had worked with Hillary Clinton for a long time, super progressive. And he told me, he says, you know, I never occurred to me that women go through their daily life feeling fear. Yeah, right? And I was like, wow. Um, it was a thunderbolt for both of us. I mean, he was embarrassed that he'd never realized that. But what I thought was, my god, well, if you don't know what it's like to feel fear, of course you go through life believing that you're going to succeed and not having a lot of doubts and not having a lot of fears or feeling intimidated. And you're like, oh, well, I can see how this, why this is self-fulfilling, why that kind of success might be self-fulfilling. If you don't know what it's like, like I do, to feel fear every day, feel for your safety, fear that you're going to be intimidated in some way. And that is, you know, that's when you realize, like, 
we have a very different, our experience is a very different worldview. But again, that, that means that I just, we have learned so much in this experience that can make us more successful now. I worked so hard to fit in, right, at work. Um, I'd worked to make myself indispensable. I worked in politics. It's a very, um, uh, you know, it, it, it's very absorbing place. I learned, I watched the men. My first job was on Capitol Hill working for Congressman Leon Panetta, went on to become President Obama's um, Secretary of Defense. I also worked with him in the Clinton White House. And I watched the men to learn strategy, but I watched the women to see how I was supposed to fit in. And what I saw with the women was they didn't drop a ball. They made themselves indispensable. They were always reliable. They saw no boundaries. And it was interesting to me that men seemed to see boundaries um, and work that was theirs and work that wasn't, and women just like dove in and made it all happen. So I learned from the guys that were doing the strategy but I emulated the women. And because of that, I can now do both, right? I know strategy, but I also know how to implement it. I'm not just the competent one, I'm the strategic one. Those are the kinds of things that we have, that we have learned. And I have, you know, I, all my life I have felt this churn, I'm going to see if you all have had the same experience, this churn that would kind of, I would feel in me, that would rise up when I was frustrated or wanted to express myself but couldn't quite find the right words. You feel a little, there's a little hemming and hawing maybe, or um, I was told to do something that this was the right choice for me but it didn't seem right and so I chose something else but I couldn't really explain why and it was just sort of this frustration and then I feel like I surfaced, came above all of that and realized, oh, what that was, what that, that was the power that was in me telling, that didn't know what, where to go and what to do, but was pushing me to the right outcome all along. That's the same power that was sitting in the McClintock, that's the same churn that they felt, right, that the McClintock women felt that Jeanette Rankin felt, that the three women who were elected to the Idaho State Legislature in 1898 felt, that we were destined for something better, right? Our creator would not have put that in us if that we were not meant to act on it. And that's what that is. It's power that you can't deny. It's undeniable, undeniable power of an American woman. So what does it mean to declare our independence from a man's world. It means we're going to stop being dependent on it. Don't depend on it. Stop expecting that it's going to work out for you the way it does for men. It doesn't mean that the world's going to change overnight. It means we're going to make the most important and powerful change we can. And that is the change that's in your own mind. It's so important. <laughs> You can change the world by changing how you engage in it. So we're gonna identify the obstacles in our own minds and proclaim that knowledge, the skills and strength that we have developed in the man's world that make us better prepared to see now. And there's five of them. One is we're gonna proclaim, this is the most important one. This is the, this is the game changer, I think. I like, humbly think I have discovered the game changer. <laughs> And the game changer for busting up, you know, thousands and thousands of years of men ruling the world um, is we are going to proclaim our sisterhood because the most corrosive manifestation of our dependence of the man's world is buying into the notion that women's success is a scarcity. Like it's a fun, yay, thank you, yeah, like it's a, Like it's a finite resource, right? That's how people act. Like it's a finite resource to be doled out to a lucky few. No one thinks that men's success is a finite resource, right? 
No one thinks there's only so much success to go around for men. If people thought that, the late night talk show hosts would not look like what they do. <laughs> Seriously, like to be, a, that is a very, who we pick to be a late night talk show host seems silly, but it is a very big statement about who we think can anchor our world, who can be gracious and lead it and put it into the right context and be charming at the same time. Who does that look like? I remember when Jimmy Fallon got that job, I was like, oh, that's so great. It's like a young guy, and, but he's carrying on in the same tradition of like going all the way back to Bob Hope. And then I'm like, oh my God, it's like a young guy carrying on the same tradition going all the way back to Bob Hope. Like it's just another generation taking, you know, taking over. And, you know, yes, he seems like a great, nice guy, and you know, he's, you know, in, like it's good to have uh, young people take over, but you're like, oh, this is where we're just gonna perpetuate it. But too often, all of us, men and women both, act as if there's only room for a woman or two women at the table. And if that one woman succeeds, that means another can't. And that's the kind of behavior we have to break free from, fighting other women for men's scraps. Because at the root of that, what we're really buying into is that I don't belong here, right? What are you really buying into if you think there's only so much success for winning women? It's that we don't really belong here, that we are guests. And that perpetuates the systems that keep women out of power. Number two, we're gonna proclaim our ambition. We're still uncomfortable in America, I believe, with women and ambition. Um, we think women are very competent. We think they can do jobs. When Hillary Clinton ran for president, um, by the time we got to the general election, a big majority of America thought she could do the job and do it well. Um, it's like, well, why does she want it? <laughs> like, that's where, it, that's where we get suspicious. Um, we had an acronym on the campaign, T-S-A-H-I-J-D-L. There's something about her I just don't like. There's something about her I just, I don't know what it is. I do, I know what it is. Um, <laughs> and it's not that everybody is sexist and people who didn't ever vote for her are sexist. It's just that a woman, you know, as I said before, go back to, this has only been 100 years, a woman seeking to be the big, the, to rule the world as you do when you're president of the United States, it's a big deal. And um, her story at the time, her story was a very unique one and it didn't quite make sense to us. She was all stepping outside of the role that women had normally had. There's something about that that's a little vexing, it's a little confounding, we don't know what to make of it. There's something about it we just don't like. You hear it said about women running in 2020, but not as much, right? And when you do hear it, it gets called out and that, that's progress. But there's something else that I've observed about how this like idea of who we find inspiring, who we find, um, uh, um, uh, you know, who we admire, um, plays out in politics. Um, and this way, it's about how we feel about some of the men. Uh, early on in the, in the race, because it's gone on forever, I know, but it's it's been going on for almost a year, and we still have like nine months, I guess, ten months, eleven months to the nomination. But um, in April of eighteen, yeah, nineteen, no, April of nineteen, um, Vanity Fair magazine asked me to write a piece about why the women weren't breaking out yet, right? Because at that time, it's like. Biden, Bernie Sanders, Pete Buttigieg, which by the way, we can all say Buttigieg now like it's nothing. <laughs> I was like, never thought I was gonna be able to say that. Um, Buttigieg, and then, um, and Beto O'Rourke, they, those were, they were leading the polls. And so they asked me to write a piece about why the women weren't breaking out. I was like, I don't know, Vanity Fair, maybe because you put Beto O'Rourke on the cover of your magazine and had Annie Leibovitz follow him around before he was even a candidate. <laughs> maybe that contributed to it. But I, um, here's the thing, like I, I thought, uh, I found Mayor Pete and Beto very inspiring too, right? And he's like, well, what's at the root of that? And I was like, you know, Beto had always reminded me of somebody. And some people said, oh, he reminds me of RFK. And I was like, yeah, but it was something else in my mind. It was like, so that's not, that wasn't it. And so I was watching Mr. Smith Goes to Washington with my parents. And um, 
And then I saw Jimmy Stewart on the Senate floor, and he had the like exaggerated hand gestures. I know I'm one to talk about exaggerated hand gestures, but he had really exaggerated hand gestures and floppy hair and this insistent voice. And I was like, oh my god. That is who Beto O'Rourke reminds me of. He reminds me of Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Like, that's how deep these cultural models are. And, you know, we have, cult we have women that are heroines, right? Particularly now, that's like a big thing in culture and movies. But it's always unexpected. There's something subversive about it. They're upsetting the, like, basic, you know, um, they're upsetting the balance, you know, like, sort of balance of, of nature. It's not something we quite yet recognize. And then Mayor Pete, you know, I, I would hear him talk about bullies, and I think, oh, you know, he reminds me of Atticus Finch, right? You imagine Atticus Finch defending the defenseless in, um, uh, in To Kill a Mockingbird. And you know, uh, Vice President Biden, you know, and, uh, like all these men I love and respect, and I don't, I don't know Beto and Pete, but, I, but Joe Biden is somebody I know really well and have a lot of love and respect for. And he did that video about Charlottesville, about the, when he announced his presidential campaign and um, you know, fighting racism and um, uh, fighting the white supremacists that, um, that protested in Charlottesville a couple years ago. And we're like, oh, that's so selfless. It's so inspiring because he's a white man, so he doesn't, he doesn't need to fight racism. Um, it's just he's doing it. He's like giving his power away. right? Well, it's like that's what that's what the people in power can do, but you know we don't find Kamala Harris inspiring in the same way. She's trying to be the first woman president. She's trying to be the first black woman president, right? Elizabeth Warren's trying to be the first woman president. They're taking power, and these are like the these are the so women have to now. <laughs> You have to, have, there's not like a, we like to have little checklists about what, what, how you're supposed to present yourself as candidates. But, you know, as uh, Councilwoman Sanchez learned, you just got to put yourself out there and you got to proclaim your ambition and understand that while you may not remind us of someone that inspires us, you are going to be an inspiration for the next generation and you're going to be part of history, so 20 years from now, they're going to look back on your story, and that is going to be part of America's story, right? That is going to be a story that we recognize, like President Trump's story, like Lisa Sanchez's story. And that's what women have to fight through now, is to become, not, not remind us of someone who's inspiring us, but have the courage to proclaim your ambition and be some, become someone who inspires us. Look at the women's soccer team. I think this is a big deal. 20 years ago, the 1999 team won. And then um, the women that run this year, they had those women as role models. They expected to be able to play soccer as a profession because of them. Three, proclaim her value. Understand, I am more astute because I've had to be so observant and work so hard to work into, to fit into the workplace. I handle disappointment better because I didn't always expect things to work out. I am resourceful beyond measure because I've always been the one to dive in and figure things out. And I have learned strategy and been the competent one. Look at um, Nancy Pelosi. You know, yesterday she came out and said that she was going to start impeachment. People thought she wasn't so strategic about this. And that woman, she has been devising strategy the way a woman's going to do it. She looks at all, she does all the hard work. She gets her arguments together. And she goes when the moment is right. And she's got the restraint to hold, not let her own ego get in the way and take, and take the moment when you know you can deliver. That's what it means when we proclaim all the skills that we have built up in fighting, in fighting our way through this man's world. Four, proclaim your voice. I've had two conversations going through my head my whole life. One, which I actually think, and then I filter it through, 
what I think, how I'm going to be challenged and what's expected of me, and only then do I speak. Right? You guys do that? Does that sound familiar? Yeah. You have that filter about what can be, what can, what, how am I going to be challenged and how am I going to defend it? I think that's why women sometimes hem and haw. I think that's why we sometimes stammer is because we, that is what we've had to condition ourselves to do. Speak. If you don't look like everybody else in the room, your perspective matters more, not less. Nobody looks at the world today says we have all figured out. We need to hear from more of us. We need more perspectives at the table. And then finally, to proclaim our own path. Take risks. Women like rules. It's weird, right? Because you would think we'd be ready to bust out, but we don't. We like rules. But I think that's because they've guided us in a world that we didn't quite understand. And we have, we, what we've seen is that you have to have the confidence of men to take risks. It's a scary thing. But what I think the point that we have come to now is what we realize if we stay stuck in these ruts, we continue to perpetuate it, the real danger is not taking that risk. The real danger is continuing to do what has been expected of us. With that, I'd like to take some questions. All right, take some questions, Tracy. Thank you. Okay, I'm not. There I am. Okay. Yeah. So thank you very much. If you have questions for Jennifer, write them down, raise your hand, and wave it around, and we'll pick them up. So here's, while I'm waiting for questions from the audience, here's my question for you. If we do the things that you say we do and become more authentic to ourselves, mm -hmm. working in the world that we have, but we've made strides the last 20 years, yeah. what do you see in the next 20 years? I think that women are going to, the way you really create, um, I think the way you really bust through is you create your own power system. You know, you, you like, is that, um, you know, Elizabeth Warren is a good example of this. Everybody said you can't run on policy, and she's like, oh, I'm going to do it, and she's doing it, and she's being very successful, and I think she'll continue to be successful because she is playing her own game. That's, a, she's a good example of somebody who's like, I set my plan, people said it wasn't going to work, and I'm going to follow it, and it's much harder when you're not playing by those rules, it's much harder for those rules to hurt you. Um, and I think that, so not every woman is in the position of being able to go out and start their own business. Or, and, but I think each of us, in whatever stage of our life we're in, can do something. I am older, so when I see a young woman not getting treated well in a meeting or being talked over, I call that out like, <laughs> oh, and I love it, love it. Yeah, so like, I'm like, that's what I can do. She, does, she doesn't have the standing to do that, but I can do it. But she's got the standing to encourage you know, women behind her. She's got the standing to teach me something that I don't know. It's like each of us have something we can do. I've got a question here that I'm, I'm going to ask just to, just to see the look on your face. <laughs> does a woman need to be elected president? Um, I think it would be, I don't, um, does a woman need to be elected president? We need one. Yeah, we need. I think it would be a lot. I think it would be a lot. Here's, here's, here's. I, I just like can't even. I don't even know where to start. Um, I think we need. We've had forty five presidents and they've all been men and what we know is when women get into these positions of leadership as well the work changes and I think everything from a co more cooperative style of leadership to the kind of issues that are considered to women to girls and women seeing people in the power it's just I think it's going to be I got to tell you this I did not think it was a big deal when I worked for Hillary I did not think it was going to be that hard or that big of a deal to elect the first woman president and they just have a very different view now. I understand now how important it is that it's not just the work that they do, but that these role models are, um, are there. So yeah, I, I think America needs a woman president. Do you think that feminism has become a partisan issue? 
Um, I worry that it has. I mean, I worry that it's code for, for partisanship. I'm worried that it's code for that divide, and I don't like that to be. Um, um, and I do, um, I have, um, in the last few years, become friends with a lot of Republican women, but they're Republican women that, um, um, you know, mostly that have, um, you know, we're not excited about the election either. Um, I have, I will do, I'll say, I'll say one thing. I have tried to, in the last um, few years, also spend time with women that I grew up with, that I had lost touch with, that um, don't agree with me, um, and, you know, find the place where we can connect as, you know, women trying to make change in the world and, um, and find, um, and I've had some break, you know, minor breakthroughs there um, to connect, to be able to connect. But I do worry that I don't want it to be, but I do. I think that's a fair concern. So this question says, what steps can I take at my job to declare my independence? I'm the breadwinner in my family, yep. and I'm one of five women in a department of 50 men. Oh, man. Isn't that amazing? See, that's what you were like, how is that still happening? But again, it's only been 100 years, so and this way it's going to go with things. Um, I, you know, this is where um, I think, this is, you know, this is where I like go back to like proclaiming your voice. It's like the, I imagine you have the conversation, the like, well, here's what I want to say, but this is what I know I'm expected to say, so I'm going to wait until I say this. And I think that you're not going to, it, you will, if you're at a position where you can absorb some blowback, because we're going to, you know, I have a chapter in my book that is called Move Forward, Draw Fire, because if you move, if you're a woman moving forward, you are going to draw fire. You are not going to avoid the fire. So, so if you're one of, you know, five out of 50 and you speak up, you are going to get, draw some fire. But I think that's like what we owe the women that came before us and the women to, um, uh, yet to come. Uh, but, you know, the way I look at it, a lot of the way the guys, the other 45 guys control, uh, you know, stay in power is because they understand the world and part of that is based on how we're going to react. And if we react, it's like, I know the world has changed because I have changed. And if you don't know that, you're at a disadvantage. So I think that, you know, speaking up in ways that you don't normally do is a very important way to change, um, to change culture. And a lot of men, you know, most of the men I work with, they want to hear, they want to learn, they want to understand, they want to have our perspective. And if you know, if you hold back, you're not doing your job, right? You're not bringing your full self to the world. Nobody looks at the world today and says, gee, we have it all figured out. <laughs> we need more, more of ourselves. Of the women in the presidential campaign, yep. what are they doing well? And who do you think, uh, let's say of the women, let's leave it just to the women, who do you think will be the standout of the women that are out there. But, Warren. And, and what, what is she doing well? Well, that's like what I said, I mean, it was what I said before. Um, I think all, um, you know, I was disappointed that Kirsten Gillibrand dropped out um, so soon. This is a very Kirsten Gillibrand pink dress. Um, that they, you know, because Gillibrand was like, that's right, I'm running to be the first woman president and I am fired up about being the first woman president, right? Like she just like, ran on that. She put that out there. Um, it didn't win her the presidency, but the next time we see a woman say, yes, I want to do this, I want that, it's not, it's not unfamiliar. I feel like that is a service that she, um, that she did. Uh, a lot of them are not, because of what Hillary went through, I think they don't get caught up as much as in the, like, there's something about her I just don't like. We're more aware of all that. But like I said before, I feel like Warren, because she's really created her own game. By the way, with the men, I feel like Pete Buttigieg has gonna, done a good job of creating his own game. If you think about it, like other candidates that have had their breakout moments, it's because they clashed with somebody else. Their growth was reliant on some on interacting with another candidate. That's very hard to replicate. That's very hard to sustain. Like Kamala Harris had that great moment in the first debate where she, I mean, great, great moment for her, where uh, she really went after Biden. And But you can't sustain that, right? What do you do next? But see, Warren, she's like building her own deal. And so I think she's going to be, and now I know the other candidates are like, we're going to go after her now. It's like, well, good luck, because it may be too late, because she has built something on her own. Not unlike what Trump did, right? Trump like built something that was sort of inoculated from normal political um, expectations and games. And, you know, she may, so I think she's the one that is going to prove to be the most durable. 
How do you think Ruth Bader Ginsburg has influenced the perception of women in power? Isn't it amazing? I mean, she must be so shocked to become like this, this major feminist icon in her late 80s. Um, but what I find inspiring about that is, you know, she was just, you know, and women in her generation were just sort of diligently doing this work, and it was very hard, um, but they kept at it, and it wasn't glamorous, and it wasn't glorious, and then much later in life, they do get their reward. It just treats, teaches me how important it is to, for us to all know these stories, right? Like, I don't even think I was taught suffrage in high school. Like, I don't, I, I have no recollection of that. Anything I know about that, it's because I read books as an adult. Um, but knowing these women's stories and building it into the um, canon of American stories is really important. Okay, last question, and then maybe you can stay afterwards if some people uh, sure. wanna come up and, and uh, talk to you. But when President Obama was elected, Everyone said, this is going to take race relations to a whole new wonderful place. And it didn't work out that way. So what do you think is going to happen when that day finally comes, and I think it'll come, that we elect the first woman president? Is that leading us forward, or is that going to give us a back step? So what I've come to believe is there are things in humankind that don't get extinguished, right? Misogyny, racism, xenophobia, and they can flare up in America, and they can, and they can, um, and but they can also have sustained time where they are, we where, where we overcome them, and. Um, you know, the time that we're in, we're in, I think, I feel the time that we're going through right now, it's a reckoning. It's a reckoning of decades of a lot of very fast uh, dynamic change, um, economically, demographically, um, and that is sort of like everything's just kind of ruptured. All of these frustrations have come roiling to the surface. Um, and it's gonna, I don't imagine that's gonna go away in one presidential cycle. Would a woman in charge, you know, I, I think if I feel like this comes out, it comes out in the wash. You gotta like have this, you have to have this kind of reckoning. I'm sure there are some people that won't, won't welcome a woman in charge. That woman is gonna draw a lot of fire, she is. But like, what are we gonna do? Like, what are we going to do? We all feel it, right? We all feel that women, said something better, that women have something more to offer, and we have to confront that. I can't promise there won't be blowback. Thank you, Jennifer Palmieri. <laughs> <laughs>